All right, Brandon, it's all you. Great. Uh, so let's let's get started. Hey guys, uh, my name's as uh, Sean said, my name's Brandon, and I'm the uh, engagement manager here at Science Friday. So many of you may already know us at, from our radio show that's been airing uh, for 25 years on public radio. Uh, but we're also we're actually the uh, Science Friday Initiative. So uh, we're also a nonprofit uh, advocating for science communication and education uh, around the world. So I just wanted to. Uh, you know, before we get started, just kind of a little, you know, about us. We've been doing this for a long time, and we've been, uh, we ran into, a couple of years ago, we ran into a problem in our social media that I kind of wanted to talk through with you guys and uh, talk through with you all and uh, help you guys uh, overcome it yourself, because I have a feeling that a lot of you are running into the same problem. So uh, to get started, uh, does this sound familiar to you? Uh, you're working with your organization, trying to do great things in the world, but your social media looks like this or like this, or even like this. Have you noticed that none of those tweets have any interaction with them? In other words, you kind of sound a little bit like this. You sound like uh, your, run, your social media is run by a bunch of robots. And honestly, this is your intervention. This is a no robot zone. So uh, to kind of let's talk about a little bit about why these sound are so robotic and why these uh, these social media posts didn't particularly work. So they sounded uh, very disconnected. They uh, even though they used uh, hashtags over and over again, uh, they weren't really into a conversation. They were just using hashtags for the sake of uh, using hashtags, so they can hopefully people will accidentally click them. They're uh, boring. There's no real reason for people to actually uh, click on this information. And probably the biggest sin of all these uh, tweets uh, to have is that they sound very generic. They sound like every other tweet. They sound very bland. It's the worst kind of marketing language. So uh, in other words, you sound a little bit like this. People absolutely hate this. It sounds totally inhuman. In fact, Part of the reason we're calling these, we're going to refer to these as robots, is that you sound like you're deep in the uncanny valley. As humans, we crave things that are a little bit unpolished, things with unique personalities. We crave this stuff on, say, dating. Uh, this story from Mike.com kind of talking about first dates and how uh, most people try to polish themselves up and be totally perfect on their first date. But uh, probably the best strategy you should have is let a little bit of your weirdness out. Be imperfect. We also crave it in our music. Uh, a lot of people sound, feel like drum machines and computers sound very unnatural. And one of the reasons is, is that humans are just by general imperfect. They, uh, the, when, you're, when you uh, produce a beat by a computer or a drum machine, it's too perfect. You're missing that even though it's a microsecond, uh, those, uh, even though it's a microsecond, you can hear those differences. And of course, we crave it in our social media. Uh, this has actually been studied uh, by the International Communication Association. They took a look at uh, people, they, took, they did a study on airline social media and found that brands that have a human voice, uh, people perceive those brands much more positively. And even though this has only recently been studied, uh, this is something that many for-profit companies have figured out for a while. Like, say, your friendly neighborhood diner, uh, Denny's is actually seen as one of the, uh, Denny's Diner is actually seen one of the most innovative pe uh, people in the social space because they act on their social media like their target audience. They share funny jokes uh, that would really appeal to like, college kids. They make memes based on their food. Uh, and they, the reason how they did this is they essentially hired someone to uh, use the social network as they would use their own. Uh, as they, you can kind of see here, that's our strategy, having that diner feel. You're just happy to be here. Uh, it's not supposed to be advertising in your face. Uh, another another uh, company that does this really well is BuzzFeed. You probably see BuzzFeed everywhere on Facebook, on Twitter. Everyone knows they do really well. But why they do really well is they don't only share stories, but they also react to them. Uh, for example, this Nicki Minaj story, uh, you know, they responded like their audience would respond to the story. They expect their audience to respond to the story about Nicki Minaj producing a TV show. They also use BuzzFeed as a person and interact with, uh, interact with Seth. So Jonah Peretti, who is the uh, founder of BuzzFeed, interacting with BuzzFeed on here. And they actually have hundreds of verticals. BuzzFeed uh, has uh, verticals for geeky. They have buzz, uh, verticals for food. They have verticals for living in Australia or the UK or India. 
And despite having all the, all, each of those verticals, despite having hundreds of writers, has a very uh, consistent voice. Uh, so BuzzFeed essentially lives without fear. People, as you can see here, brands often worry about tone, perhaps worried at causing offense by an opinion. But honestly, like, for, if you, people can see right through that. And BuzzFeed isn't afraid to do this. They live without fear. Um, there are actually uh, some nonprofits that have done this well. Uh, so, for example, WNYC, which is New York's public radio station based here, uh, they balance sharing stories and information with also sharing like all caps, uh, slang, GIFs, all sorts of fun stuff. One thing of note is that their Instagram actually acts like a person who lives in New York. Uh, PRI, Public Radio International, our distributor, not only uh, shares stories from uh, not only share stories from their different shows, but also responds to them. So, for example, uh, this you can't really see because it's a still image, but this is actually a uh, GIF showing how far sneezes actually go if you don't cover your mouth, and it goes very far. So, it, obviously, uh, PRI is a little freaked out. Um, even it's not just media either. Uh, Planned Parenthood, no matter what you think of their politics, they take a very dis definitive human voice to get their message across. Uh, and of course, we can talk about uh, Science Friday. So how did, we, how did Science Friday uh, do this? So we kind of thought about it, and since we're scientists, we you know, went a little mad scientist here. And to make your, to, we kind of determined to make our organization sound human, we have to make our organization into a human. So the way we did that is by creating something called a social media persona. Basically, if you're the, that's basically the anthropomorphized version of your organization. Uh, in other words, if your organization was a human, what human would they be? So uh, one of the things that's very important and very distinct about this is that your persona is not and shouldn't be a specific high-profile person from your organization. Uh, for example, Science Friday, our persona is very specifically not Ira Flato. And there's a couple of reasons why you, your organization should not ha have a high-profile person be that. First, um, ne on a negative side, it puts you at uh, risk for scandal, for example, like, or if something happens, uh, and you're kind of tied to that. Your, your mission is tied to that person. And the quintessential example of that is uh, Lance Armstrong and Live Strong. Uh, but on a more positive note, it also limits the ability of this high-profile person to be an, a high-profile advocate, an additional advocate to your own social media. Uh, so essentially, by create, uh, by, for creating a uh, public uh, social media persona, you're essentially creating a brand new person for your social media to be on uh, public, your, uh, for your organization to be on social media. You're ba essentially, think of it as you're, having, you're, you're giving birth to a, new, a brand new human. You're creating a character. You're uh, writing a new uh, fan thing. For the geeks out there, you're creating a fan character of your organization. So how exactly did Science Friday do this? So uh, in order to do, let's first kind of look back to the bad old days of 2014 uh, and see what our social media looked like. Before, um, before coming up with our persona, our social was a mess. We essentially posted the same things week after week, after week. Uh, not only that, but on other social networks like Twitter, uh, most of the people in our organization had access to the accounts. So the voice would be completely disparate and completely uh, different depending on who would use it. We would post sporadically and then all at once, and everyone would post in their own significant way. And you could probably tell, like, the first tweet is different, was a different, the first and second tweet was probably a different person than the third tweet, which was definitely a different person from the fourth tweet. And if you look at that, uh, if you look, all those uh, tweets have very little engagement. So uh, for those of you who are a little, uh, who are um, just thinking about starting social media, engagement essentially is the number of, like, uh, retweets, the number of favorites, uh, not just people clicking on the link, but people interacting with the tweet itself. Um, so our, uh, as, as I said, our, our social media kind of went from, goes from the very formal, like this post, which has like uh, credits and links and stuff like that, to the very uh, casual. And it came across as incredibly scattered. So we uh, put on our get along shirts and we started brainstorming. And what Science Friday came up with uh, was a phrase. And that phrase informs who we are and what we do on social media. And the phrase that we came up with, drum roll please, 
is Science Friday, the person, is that really excited person at a dinner party who really wants to tell you about this cool thing they learned. Let's break it down. So every, uh, every part of this sentence informs who Science Friday is on social media. So first, really excited. So at SciFry, the person Science Friday, gets really excited about science and learning. They're curious. They think everything is the coolest thing ever. They use a lot of exclamation points. Uh, most importantly, being excited means that they're not very jaded. We're, uh, we're all about earnestness and excitement and being super fun. Uh, person. Uh, while some pers personas may be gendered based on what they do, what their mission is, and what, they're, what you guys are trying to do, Science Friday is specifically not because science is for everyone. At a dinner party. So this kind of implies two things, tone and age. Dinner parties are casual and fun, but they're also very specifically a grown-up thing to do. You wouldn't necessarily want to be screaming or on social media using all capital letters at a dinner party, but you also wouldn't want to be too standoffish and formal. It's not, you're not in a black tie. You're, uh, you're not wearing you know, in a tuxedo or whatever. You're at your friend's house, but you're also being a little classy. Uh, and they also want to tell you about this cool thing they learned. And this part of the phrase actually uh, helps steer the content. Our, our tweets will very often include a cool fact, a did you know or today I learned. And we use these pieces of trivia to uh, help tease larger stories. And once we have that phrase, uh, once we have this phrase, this Science Friday person, we can figure out how this person we sh can use social media. It's not so much like, our org should be on this platform, or uh, we need to be on Twitter but not Facebook, or something like that. It's what platforms would this person we've created logically use? So for us, uh, Science Friday, because it's a really, uh, we're about factoids and stuff like that, we're, that's part of the, a big reason that we're on Twitter or Facebook. We're also specifically, although not listed here, on Tumblr, because uh, sci there's a, we're Science Friday, the person is a science enthusiast. And there's actually a very good, uh, very large science enthusiast community on Tumblr. So we want to make sure that we're there with those people. Um, so we are getting close to the, uh, the halfway point, but I wanted to kind of give you a preview of what's going to be coming up in the second half. Uh, first, I'm gonna, we're gonna, uh, coming up soon, we're going to show you how to create a social media persona. And we're gonna, I have a worksheet for you guys for tips that are coming up your own. And then how helping a persona help sci-fi and can really help you. But at this point, let's, uh, let's, we're, about ha we're midway through the presentation, so let's open it up for, to some questions. All right, the first one comes from my good friend Robert Shallett, who says, I appreciate what you say about not having a high-profile person tweeting because of the risks involved, but other sources say that you want your CEOs to be human and have them tweet in an ideal way to accomplish. Is there an ideal way to accomplish this? How do you balance that? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm actually going to be alluding to this uh, a little bit later in the program, but uh, this is actually, um, it's not so much that you, it's one or the other, you want, you want both. So uh, essentially, you don't want this, uh, that your CEO to be the only voice of your organization. You don't want this high profile person to be the only voice. You, essentially, you would want two advocates, and you can have that with your organization and your CEO. Uh, and one of the things that uh, one of the things that worked really well for us is that by, uh, um, and I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later, uh, by creating a diff separate Science Friday person, that allowed Ira to uh, share things that he was really interested in, and allowed him to uh, you know share, expand expand the umbrella of what Science Friday is, share stories that he's interested in, and also. Uh, you know, advocate for us, as, as become an advocate for Science Friday on his, own, on his uh, own thing. So essentially we get two for the price of one, and you can actually do this with the rest of your staff as well. Um, so your high, uh, I guess as a, a way to kind of wrap, uh, to put a bow on it, your high profile person should not be your, uh, should not be the main course it can be, you, should, you shouldn't have, uh, your, your high profile person shouldn't be the main course, they should be the dessert. Gotcha, and well, there's a lot of examples out there, so just to, just to jump on to that, I think Brandon's 100% right. If you look at what Ford Foundation is doing, Darren Walker is prolific on Twitter. Uh, Jim Canales at the Bar Foundation is a huge and really smart voice on Twitter, but he's not tweeting as the Bar Foundation. He's tweeting as Jim, uh, and oftentimes retweeting stuff the Bar is doing. They actually complement each other really nicely. Is that more or less sort of the idea you're getting at, Brandon, and I know you're going to come back to this. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, like it, um, you, 
You've also – yeah, that's, that's 100% what I'm talking about. Uh, you, uh, by essentially, you're allowing this prolific – this person to be also prolific on Twitter, and they're not they're, – although they are closely associated with Science Friday, they're tweeting under their own name, like uh, Ira Plato, et cetera. So, yeah, that's exactly it. All right, so next question comes from Cecilia. Now, she's the social media manager and the only person tweeting, posting it to Facebook, et cetera. Can I work on the persona myself, or who else needs to be involved in the development of that persona? So in other words, should I do it alone, or is this a group activity? Well, um, you could certainly do it alone, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would actually bring in people who don't necessarily uh, – who aren't necessarily like thinking about your uh, market, thinking about social media stuff all the time. I would bring in people like who, uh, like maybe bring in one person from each department or something like that. Because this person uh, should reflect who you guys are as a greater organization. So um, yes, you can certainly do this alone, and you can like come up with this person. But I find it, you know, I, I found that when I uh, work, I'm very much in, uh, pro collaboration as much as possible and being open and uh, opening it up to everybody because great ideas can come from anywhere. So um, we can, uh, so very much, when we were developing this, we kind of used a little bit of everything. So we, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the, uh, Charles uh, Burquist, our director, was one of the, who uh, is really great on Twitter, but he, is, uh, he focuses mostly on directing the show. That's his, uh, that's his main day job. But we actually, look, uh, while we were creating this program, we looked uh, really closely at his social media, uh, we looked very closely at his social media as a way to um, help build this as well. When, uh, I, when I was working on this, and I was also working with uh, Christian Scotta, who is, uh, works on uh, digital stra uh, content strategy for us. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely bring in other people from other parts of your organization. May, not everybody's in the organization, because I think that, that may get a little too unwieldy. But uh, um, you might just bring in, like, one person for department, because you don't know who, or just people who you know are, like, have really cool ideas or creative, whether they're, like, the, uh, C, they're in the C-suite or they're, like, the latest hire. Just, uh, just, and then kind of, like, work around and play with it. Um, and I have a bunch of questions and stuff that you guys will be able to answer and work with uh, together. So, um, coming up. Gotcha. So the next question comes from uh, from Allison, and she says, "What advice do you have for organizations that speak to multiple audience and demographics that may have a harder time arriving at a single social media persona?" So, so in other words, uh, you may be doing lots of different things. You're talking about science, and maybe you're talking about oh, I don't know, art. Uh, how do you how do you create a persona that's going to talk to maybe two very different audiences? So one of the things to keep in mind is that you're not only you're not just you're not just creating essentially a voice for your organization social media. You are creating a person. So people are three D. They have many interests. Um, I don't see think there's. Uh, I know you. Uh, one of the things like we actually do cover a lot of uh, art stuff, and we cover that. Uh, and so I think like. I, by creating this person, uh, cre by creating a essentially a person, uh, a, a organization person, um, you'll be able to like you can ex you can cover both. Uh, one of the things that I think might also be in there is uh, like there are while you are creating a persona overall for social media stuff, uh, your persona can act slightly differently on different networks. So you can have uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about goals in a bit, but uh, you can also you can uh, figure out like uh, what like essentially how you can like depending on who your audience is on the different networks you can slightly adjust that like much like how you're a different person at work and a different person with your friends and a different person with your family and a different person with your like uh, super conservative fall relatives or super like hippie uh, far relatives or whatever you are gonna uh, you have different facets of yourself that you present to each of those people so um, and you're essentially not creating one voice for everyone you're creating a person that can speak to different places Next question comes from Shoshana, and this is going to sound familiar to an awful lot of folks, I expect. I work with older, Shoshana, what is old? I'm almost 45, so I'm a little worried you're talking about me. I work with, quote, older people who are not familiar with social media, and this means I need to get buy-in from them to do social media. How do I teach them not only about the value of using social media, but also the value of developing this persona idea? Hmm. So one of the, um, I think what really helps is uh, showing them, uh, and I, um, I think one of the things that really helps is to talk about how social media, uh, most people uh, in the past have gotten their, like, 
there's usually been one way to get uh, content or one way to reach people, whether through mailers or through like uh, newsletters or through a newspaper or an ad or something like that. Uh, think social media essentially is you curating that experience for yourself. It's um, it's not so much a waste of time as it is a it's not it's not it's not a waste of time at all, but it's more of a um, like traffic driver, if that makes sense. It's uh, very much where people are. You have to, although you do work with a lot of older people, you don't necessarily, uh, it may not necessarily, they may not necessarily be the audience you want to reach. Uh, so you do have to, um, you have to, uh, that is essentially where, you essentially you have to follow the people. That's where the people are. Uh, Facebook has uh, several billion follow, uh, uh, several billion people on, right now and uh, on their network as well. And there are hundreds of millions on these other networks. This is just where people are getting their information. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the numbers on there, but they're, like, especially with uh, younger, uh, younger folks, uh, most people get their information from these social networks as well. Uh, and I can, I, I'll, I'll look up exactly what the figure is and share that after the presentation. But um, I think one of the ways to convince them is just by saying, you know, that's where the people are. Although it's not like, uh, it's, it may be a little hard because it's physical. Maybe just uh, showing them, uh, like and like, kind of showing them the results. Uh, one of the big things is also is that um, you may uh, try to get them involved. Like uh, getting getting older people involved in social media uh, may be a little bit difficult, but also it's like I think one of the uh, big thing. Like what, it's very easy to kind of see the value of it once you start using it. And actually, by having them use it, uh, if you uh, uh, in your organization, you can actually uh, add, like you know make advocates for your uh, for themselves. They they they'll uh, they may they may enjoy it a lot. Last question, and then we're going to get back into it, Brandon, and then we'll have of course time for questions at the end. Uh, Mandy asks a question that I think is probably on the minds of many folks. So we're a nonprofit with a serious mission. At the same time, I believe we can inject humor at the right times within our social media persona that makes most compelling and interesting to read. Do you agree? And how do we maintain that balance? Uh, I'm sorry, she's correcting me. How do we maintain that balance of seriousness and humor while staying true to who we are, which is a, a nonprofit with a serious mission? I mean, I, yes, I 100% agree. I think there are definitely times when levity and jokes are uh, important. Uh, for example, uh, Science Friday, they, um, like we have times when we're covering very serious uh, scientific discoveries or big news or politics. But we also have times when we're covering fun things, um, like, you know, uh, like rats with jobs or uh, the science of emo like how emoji uh, were uh, created. I think there's definitely, uh, I, I very much agree that it's, um, that uh, you do need that you can have a balance of that. Uh, one of the uh, so and we how we kind of do that is take it on a topic by topic basis and kind of understanding uh, like again as I kind of said to the previous question, um, you can uh, this you are essentially creating a person. So and people have multiple facets and they can uh, both you know be funny and be serious and be sad and uh, all of those things. Uh, so uh, I think that I, maybe the, uh, a good example to look at for this is uh, Antonio French, who, uh, a couple, who uh, has been, he's a city councilman, I believe, in St. Louis or Ferguson. He was uh, pretty involved with the Ferguson protest, but he also does a really great job of balancing, like, not only, uh, he, now he is a person, but he also does a really great job of um, balancing, uh, uh, balancing these things. Um, another person, and I apologize for using mostly uh, left-leaning uh, uh, ideas, but another person for this might be, uh, like I kind of mentioned, Planned Parenthood. They have a very uh, serious, they, they have a very serious mission, but also they, as you as you saw on the tweet, were able to get like a fun Beyonce reference out there. Um, and uh, they, you can, there are, uh, you, you can, there's definitely a balance there. All right, why don't we get back into it? The only thing I would maybe add, Brandon, is that uh, there's a fellow out there by the name of Barack Obama who has a pretty serious yeah. job, and God bless him. That man has a wonderful sense of humor and finds the right places to inject it from time to time. Uh, and he even uses a Twitter, from what I understand. Um, anyway, we'll have time for the rest of your questions in, the, in a very short order, but I know Brandon's got some really great stuff ahead of us, so let's, let's go ahead and get to it. Brandon, you want to take us back into it? Yep, absolutely. And as Sean said, 100% Barack Obama would be a great one, or a lot, many politicians uh, would be great people to look at for that. So um, now that we've got this idea, let's uh, dust off our liberal arts skills and let's get working. 
So um, while you're creating a uh, social media persona, there are a couple of things you need to figure out. Uh, at the very first thing, you need to figure out what your social media goal is. Goals are incredibly important. They're not just, uh, they're the map on which you travel. And I'm not just talking about things like getting more traffic or getting more donors or uh, passing this resolution or whatever, but uh, uh, basically everyone has this, those goals. What you want is, is a goal for how people react to your social media. What's the feeling that you want people to perceive when you uh, pop up on their feed? How do you want to be perceived on social? Um, another thing you kind of want to ask yourself is who do you want to reach? Do you want to reach your current uh, base? Do you, are you going to be speaking to the choir? Do you want to reach people that you've never reached before? Um, or whatever. So of, uh, of those, what's a short phrase that you could use to describe uh, those people? Who believes in your mission? Who doesn't? Uh, where do they live? How old are they? What gender are they? All of, the, all of those information. So uh, to kind of use Science Friday as a goal, as uh, example, Science Friday's goal is to spread enthusiasm and excitement for science. And Science Friday wants to reach people who are not afraid to geek out. So now that we have those, like, both the goal and who we want to reach, uh, we can use that as a really good baseline. But we want to get, if we're creating a person, that's not enough to create a person. We want to get a little bit more specific. And when I did this at uh, the conference uh, last uh, October, I actually, uh, had, we actually did this all in the group together. We can't really do that on a webinar, but I did upload a worksheet to kind of help you guys work through this. Uh, you can find it at sci-fi.me slash persona worksheet. It's printable. You can write in your answers, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and have, you know, work through it that way. And this kind of includes all that information. So uh, once we have those, uh, so now that we have those in this worksheet, uh, we're going to figure out, basically go through a series of questions that will help uh, figure out, take this like very broad phrase and very broad goal and uh, basically uh, bring them, like, expand them into a person. So the first question we kind of asked ourselves was, what are some adjectives that you would describe yourself, uh, describe your organization? Is your organization more of a Luke Skywalker, a Princess Leia, or a Han Solo, or even a Chewie? Uh, what, what, uh, how would you describe that, uh, your organization, using specifically adjectives? And once you actually have those adjectives, what are some of the hobbies that are, and this is very important, completely unrelated to your mission that this person would have? And uh, I know I've said this a couple of times, but I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, well, you're, you, wanna, uh, you want to – people are three-dimensional. They're very fleshed out. They have interests that are both uh, – uh, that could be your mission, but also they might have interest this, – this person may have interests that uh, – like knitting, for example, or biking, or uh, going to uh, reading or writing or any of these things, photography. Uh, what – of these people, who would these, uh, what are some of the hobbies that, this, that your organization, if they were a person, may have? Uh, what are their demographics, as we kind of talked about? Are they male, female, is it not important? Uh, how old are they? Uh, what, basically describe who this person is. And to this, you can kind of look both at, who, one of the really good places you could look at this is look at people, uh, look at who you want to uh, reach and who, what your, uh, who, who you want to uh, who you want to reach on social media? Um, is there uh, is there what's the um, what is the most likely place you will run into this person? Uh, would you run into them at like say a bookstore, a bar, a uh, on the street? Would you run into them at a concert? Uh, would you run into them at the diner? Where would they be most likely on a Wednesday night? Not necessarily a Friday. Uh, on a Wednesday night after work, would they be uh, at home with uh, on the couch with Netflix? Would they be uh, like, or um, would they be, you know, enjoying some out dinner? Would they be at some uh, cool event? Would they be out hiking or camping? Uh, I, I, I kind of find Wednesday is a really uh, very important because it's not necessarily uh, it's where they would be maybe on their most average night. Uh, next, is there a quote you can imagine them saying? Uh, like, is there, can you imagine them say, so say, for example, the person we're coming up with is Titus from uh, 
the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, as you can see here. Like, you can, can you, you who, what, what's something that's not necessarily related to their mission that you might want to say? So, going to be famous, going to be on TV. Uh, for, if we're going to use the Person Science Friday as an example, uh, we can share the things like, uh, as an example, we could do something like, uh, hey, did you hear about this really awesome thing that we just saw? Or, oh my God, you have to see this. Uh, something very excited like that. And then uh, one of the most important things is how would you describe this person to a friend at a dinner party or at a party? So imagine you're at like a friend's house or at a event or something, and your friend points to this person that you're creating and says, who is that over there? What is like the very short, how would you describe this person? Who, how would you, uh, this, would you describe, uh, how, how would you sell your friend in a couple of, in maybe a sentence or two on what this person is? So. Now that we have all of this information, um, and again, you, I, I have the worksheet that will allow you guys to fill this in, at, um, which I'll give you the link in a second again. But now that you have all this information, you can kind of, uh, to use the Science Friday model, we can kind of uh, build this into a phrase to help guide who your persona is. So um, to, kind of this, to build this phrase, we'd say, my friend, your organization, is the... Uh, how you describe your persona, at the, where you'd be most likely to run into them, who wants their human goal. And one of the big things that uh, when we ran into, uh, when we did this, uh, one of the big things that I've run into with people when I've been talking about this presentation is uh, that a lot of people want to use their mission. And again, uh, you don't want to necessarily use your mission. Your mission, I guess, uh, to kind of emphasize this point, your mission is, uh, in creating this person, your mission is implicit. You want them, you want something, uh, like, because they are your organization, they already believe in your mission. That's, all, that's obvious, but we want to create, uh, figure out what their goal is, uh, what their human goal is, so uh, for, uh, at, what their human goal is, uh, in addition to what your mission is. So, for example, uh, to go back to the Science Friday example, uh, we want to tell uh, the person at the dinner party about this really cool thing we just learned. So, uh, yes. So, um, I, and honestly, like, uh, I, the worksheet is right here. It's sci-fi.me slash persona worksheet. You can download it, uh, stuff like that. And honestly, uh, and I, I would love to see what you guys come up with. Please uh, tweet me at the Ector. Um, once you come up with what, what your phrase is. And I'd be happy, we can workshop some stuff, it'll be fun. Um, we, did this, we did this live at the, uh, uh, at the um, ComNet uh, 15, but I'd love to do it over social media as well, because that's what social media is, interaction. So now that you've come up with this person, now that you've come up with this person that is your organization, this uh, social media persona, what would you use them, what do you use them for? So. Uh, now that you're more comfortable in your own skin, you can use more playful language. Uh, you can use things like emoji or just things that are just like plain, like how you would, language that you use with a friend, because it is a friend, it's a person. Uh, you can, um, and now if we compare it to, remember back, way back when, uh, in 2014, uh, look at the engagement uh, back then and see how like relatively low it is compared to what it was when we, once we have this persona. Um, this uh, compared, we had 39 retweets to 46 faves compared to, say, like six retweets to three uh, faves, things that people don't necessarily uh, see. And this also, uh, this phrase can, this persona can also dictate content. So like this, for example, this was a corpse flower that, uh, if you, in, that, uh, up, that was blooming at De in uh, Denver. And if you guys, uh, as you can see here, a corpse flower smells exactly like it sounds. It smells disgusting, but they only bloom every once in a while. So um, we were able to, so we were able to do fun stuff like that. Um, not only does by create by creating this person, not only does it allow you to uh, use more playful language, it also allows you this person to interact with more stuff. So one of the things that we did, uh, a couple, uh, we released a video about. Uh, uh, the Sparkle Muffin uh, Peacock Spider. If you don't know peacock spiders, they're spiders that dance. It's really, it's really cool. Um, so we posted the video on our Tumblr, uh, and this actually, uh, the University of California, Sa uh, San Diego Health Sciences Department, actually responded to us and said, Sparkle Muffin's our new band name. And uh, Science Friday, the person was able to respond, oh man, can we get on this? You know, let's start a band. 
And Brookhaven Labs, which is based out, I believe, in Long Island, uh, wanted to join too. And just like that, we became uh, we became a band. And uh, I, although it did, it looks like the uh, the notes did kind of cut off here. This got hundreds of notes on Tumblr, which is the big engagement um, metric on Tumblr. For those of you who don't know. Uh, and people loved it. It was great. Um, from uh, one of the things that uh, I, I did potentially at like the moth years ago was uh, there was a public media brawl between a couple of different public media shows where they were all trash talking each other. And people, it, it got picked up on Storify. People loved it, uh, or it got posted on Storify and got picked up in a bunch of places. And people, because people love that stuff, they love seeing their organizations uh, interact with one each other, uh, with one another. Um, it also allows us to interact with our audience more. We, uh, we, we have, we, sometimes we'll do call-outs on air and we can respond to people. And like, although this, react, this uh, particular one talks about uh, is saying, telling somebody they're right, we can also, uh, while the show is going live, respond, if somebody has a question, answer the, try to answer that question the best way we can. Uh, Science Friday can answer that the best way they can. Uh, but I think the most important thing and the coolest thing is it allows yourself, to, uh, your staff, to share things that are relevant to their interests and to expand what you'd normally talk about, uh, especially on platforms like Twitter and Tumblr that are very easily are, uh, allow you to retweet and reblog. So um, this is Chow, one of our uh, web producers, who was able to share, uh, although this is a really great image, it's not something we really had room for in Science Friday. So we shared a story, um, we shared, she shared a story from another organization, and Science Friday retweeted it to half a million people. Um, now let's comp uh, and this is actually really great because if we compare it, if we go back again to the bad old days of 2014, you can see these, these, as you can tell, these are all like completely different people. But uh, and then, but then you look at, uh, but by uh, allowing our staff to be retweeted by Science Friday, and by allowing your staff to retweet, be shared by you, uh, become uh, be highlighted by you. You can allow, uh, you can uh, kind of break that and develop your own institutional voice. Uh, it also really allows you to post a lot more. Now, uh, oftentimes if you're posting, um, you'll uh, very much, um, you, you'll, you don't want to post too often because you're afraid of spamming your uh, audience. Uh, people will get annoyed. They'll mute you. They'll unfollow to use the Twitter parlance. Uh, but by sharing stuff, especially on Twitter for us, uh, from our staff like Char uh, Charles, instead of post uh, like Charles, our director, like I talked about earlier, who likes to share uh, um, who likes to share what happened on this day in science history on his Twitter account? Um, it allows you. It it shows that it's coming from this other person. Um, so uh, essentially, it will uh, instead of posting once an hour, we can post several times an hour because it's not all coming from Science Friday. You see that Science Friday retweeted it, but you, it's coming specifically from Charles. Uh, or for example, Ira. It allows Ira to make uh, to advocate. It also allows this high-profile person, in addition to your staff that we talked about earlier, uh, advocate for your mission and uh, make things like that. And what, that's actually the big thing is that it does allow your staff to advocate. Uh, once your staff become you right now, uh, want to kind of speak to the question we had earlier. One of the um, big things is that we you want your CEO posting, but uh, that's or the one high profile profile person posting in addition to Science Friday. But that's just one person. If you uh, kind of instead of all of these people having to speak under uh, the Science Friday Twitter account, we now uh, Science Friday is now an additional person with all these people. So it really, uh, so we have, instead of having just one advocate, uh, we have like 15 advocates. We can uh, get the word out, we can share information, and these, uh, these your, your uh, staff can actually uh, grow into personalities in their own right and become uh, high profile people, in, uh, high profile uh, advocates in themselves. And probably the most important thing is that you won't sound like a robot anymore. Um, so, some key takeaways from the rest of the pre from the entire presentation: uh, People prefer a total, an imperfect human voice to something that's very deep in the uncanny valley. Uh, you create, a, uh, you should create a persona for your organization on social media to sound a little bit more like a human. And then once you have that persona, you can use that to boost engagement uh, in gen boost engagement on your social media. And I think this is probably the most important thing again: uh, a persona frees your staff up to share their interests expand your umbrella, and become advocates for your organization. So uh, with that, I just wanted to open up, I, we have about 15 minutes left, maybe a little less. I wanted to open up the questions.
All right, that's perfect. Thanks, Brandon. So the first question comes in from our good friend Elizabeth, and she says, I would love some ideas about how to get buy-in from senior team members who may not be 100% on board with the more casual language of social media and terrified of being too breezy. I think one of the ways to do that, and um, I understand there's a fear about being breezy, um, but one of the things that uh, I guess one of the ways you can help build that is uh, first you can look at the success stories. There's lots. Uh, there are uh, there are a few that I allude to here, but there's also uh, a and you can kind of just point and compare, like say, uh, find organizations that, uh, and if you contact me after, the, if you tweet me after the um, meeting, I'd be happy to pull, like pull some for you because I'm not quite sure what, uh, what your, um, what sphere your organization is. But there are people, there are, I'm, I guarantee that there's at least one organization in your sphere that already does something like this. Um, I guess the other way to look at this is um, think of it as a language. So uh, in the same way that you wouldn't necessarily put out a um, Eng uh, an English language French uh, an English language press release to um, someone who's a little bit more to uh, someone who's in a different country say they speak French or whatever uh, you wouldn't want to necessarily be too formal on social media that's it that's a language you have to speak to the people that you want to so uh, maybe that's some way to talk about it is that's not so much your yes you're being informal but informality is the language of social media and the internet at large Oh, I hope that helps. Comes, uh, the next question is coming from our good friend Stephen out of the California Healthcare Foundation. He says, which platforms do you find are getting the most engagement, and is there any guess as to why that may be? Also, uh, before we actually answer that question, several folks are asking if we can go back and show the key takeaway slide again. So, Brandon, any chance you could take us back and just leave us there while you answer this question? So, what are the best platforms out there and why? So um, honestly, there are, we for and, I, and I'm going to give a huge caveat at the top of this and say this is what works for Science Friday, uh, and there and honestly, it kind of works like uh, the thing is that every uh, you shouldn't really be thinking like there are platforms that drive more traffic. There are platforms that are like very specifically like insular. But uh, I want to the huge caveat at the very top is that this is what works for Science Friday, and what works for Science Friday may not work for your organization, um, but for us. Uh, we found that the, the largest traffic driver to us is Facebook. Uh, just because Facebook, uh, like Facebook, there, we have a lot of fans on Facebook. Facebook has it's more. Facebook fans are, are more likely to, uh, you know, click links or follow through. But one of the things that uh, I've noted, one of the big things that's changing with Facebook is uh, Facebook is um, now uh, cutting. Is now uh, because everything you you guys may. Uh, as you may know, Facebook, uh, everything that shows up in your news feed is actually determined by an algorithm that used to be called edge rank but now has no name. Um, and your edge rank score, kind of def your uh, score in that algorithm determines how many people see your post and how many people your posts reach. So um, basically, uh, you may, uh, so uh, if you, um, like that algorithm is changing all the time. So uh, I'm guessing that because Facebook is now looking towards more uh, natively in native content, they do boast things that are uploaded natively versus the links out. Um, as far so we do see a lot of engagement on there. Um, on Twitter, we do we we see it's really easy for people to uh, engage with us. Uh, they uh, you know it's very easy for people to uh, because it's you know very quick. We do we live tweet our show every week. Um, and pe we were very good at answering people's questions. But I think, um, like, I think, and then uh, Tumblr, although it doesn't necessarily drive traffic to Science Friday, that much traffic to ScienceFriday.com, is really great as an insular, uh, great as an insular community for us because uh, we kind of adapt our stuff for science for uh, for the Tumblr community itself. So um, I guess those are our, those would be our three. We are also on Instagram, and we're starting up a Pinterest and Snapchat channel to kind of uh, fit this. To, uh, to expand a little bit. Um, but actually, one interactive medium, and I, I realize I'm kind of going, maybe going into the weeds here, uh, one interactive medium that I'm actually a big fan of, uh, that we've been doing a lot of stuff on, that may be, uh, that's tied to Twitter, is called is Periscope, which is essentially live streaming. And uh, it, that by its, that by um, its own, uh, by the fact of what it is, it's a very interactive medium. People, uh, Send, uh, send comments and ask questions in real time, and we answer, that's what we do. We're like we'll have our uh, education manager Ariel like be doing, an, well, she'll be doing an experiment with our Periscope audience and answering those questions in real time because she's a former teacher and she's really uh, good at it. So uh, I guess 
I, I guess kind of the larger thing is engagement means different things on different platforms. Uh, so I, but for us, the biggest drivers of traffic of engagement are uh, maybe uh, probably uh, actually we probably get more engagement on Twitter, Tumblr, uh, and Periscope, and then Facebook as well. And I, I, I realized that was a little bit all over the place, but I'd be happy to clarify a little bit more as well. All right, so our friend Allison up in New York has a question, and uh, talk slowly because I have a feeling she's taking notes. She's uh, actually going to be teaching her staff all this stuff in just a couple of days' oh, time. Um, does Science Friday use the persona that you've developed across other communications platforms? So by that she means, is this the editorial voice of the website, and is this the voice you use on the blog, or in email blasts, and in newsletters, or is this persona really confined to what we think of as social media right now, the Twitters, the Facebooks? Or is this really kind of spread out across all of the opportunities to do outreach that you guys do? So um, it's, uh, for some of the things that you mentioned, this persona uh, is really kind of only uh, for social media. But I would actually include newsletters under social media. I would say more and more, although they're like kind of a blast. Uh, they, uh, they, do, uh, they are a way for people to like, interact with you in a very old, like, I guess for lack of a better term, old school way. Uh, but as far as editorially on, uh, we have an editorial voice that's uh, distinct on ScienceFriday.com and on the Science Friday uh, radio team, uh, radio side of things, and our education staff. But really, this, this persona uh, is for social media because uh, in many of those other places, uh, the, per the voice that you're already hearing is the, vo is the voice of the person that's writing it or the voice. Uh, we, we generally don't have, we don't have staff writers on sciencefriday.com. Every piece comes from, or we don't have like a general, I mean, um, Science Friday staff at Science Friday, on sciencefriday.com. Our, uh, our articles will come from Julie, uh, Julie Leibach, the managing editor of our website, or, uh, or Chow, who uh, I mentioned earlier, or from uh, other people. And same thing with the radio. Uh, the voice you're hearing, uh, because we do want to separate uh, our social media persona from, I, the voice you're hearing is Ira, and so that, uh, 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 so that is very closely associated with Ira's voice. So um, really, it's just like, uh, we, it's really just, um, I guess to answer your question, kind of for, uh, for Science Friday in particular, ours is, uh, to, uh, is restricted to social media. All right, so the next question comes from Susan, and she asks, hey, so Brandon, do you have any tips or tricks or best practices in getting everyone to follow that persona, use that similar format? Uh, for years, she's been the only person in her organization posting on social media, but now it looks like she's going to get a chance to share this responsibility with two other folks. And I think the question in their mind is, how are we going to be able to stay consistent inside this persona uh, when we have very different voices and very different writing styles? Um, so one of the things I think you guys can uh, do is come, uh, if you're going to be sharing uh, responsibility for your social media with other people, come up with the persona with those other people. Um, you don't necessarily want the persona to sound like any one person. You don't want, uh, like, we, like I was sharing the examples from uh, 2014 from us, where uh, you can very obviously tell who is what. Uh, come up with the persona together. Think of it as um, a, uh, basically come up with this character, come up with guidelines, come up with like, you know, essentially a, um, for lack of a, for like a, a character Bible for this, uh, for this persona. And uh, think of that persona as a character that you're playing on social media. Um, so uh, I guess really two ways to help do that. First, you know, help this, uh, work with those, these two people that, to help develop this persona. And then once you have that persona uh, and have developed it and come up with, came up with like some rules and stuff, uh, think of it as a, uh, you know, a part that you're playing. And uh, that so and so that and also like bounce ideas off of each other. Like, do you guys think this will work? Do you guys uh, when you're like in the moment? I'm assuming. Um, hopefully, you guys will be. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are going to be in the same office or not. But uh, if you are, just like uh, turn to the person and be like, hey, you know, what do you think of this or something like that. So um, that may be uh, that might be a good way to kind of uh, to to for lack of a better term, uh, stabilize and normalize the voice. Dave Anderson has a question that we've seen a couple times uh, here, and that is he is very curious about the proper frequency of messaging on Twitter and Facebook uh, and work with limited resources. So I think the question is, how often should you post? Is there an ideal number of posts to do a day or a week or whatever? Um, so ideally for uh, – and um, we like to post – and I'll, uh, I'm going to preface this. This is a Science Friday thing. 
Um, and I'm going to preface this by saying this is what works. We, we kind of came up with this schedule uh, based on, like, what content we were able to share and uh, our, you know, our followers, you know, uh, our follower number and uh, things like that. So essentially we post uh, usually between uh, 8 a.m. Uh, during working hours between 8 a.m. and around, like, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. We post on Science Friday uh, on Twitter once an hour. And then afterwards, once every hour and a half until around, uh, you know, mid, around 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Uh, 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 on the East Coast. So we get, include the West Coast on there. Mostly because uh, we, uh, a lot of our audience is based, we have a lot of uh, people in California, but we also have a lot of people, our largest audience is in New York. Um, on Facebook, we post once or twice, uh, try, we try to post like twice a day. I would say once or twice a day is good. Uh, for, in for any organization, posting on Facebook is once or twice a day is good. Uh, one of the things to note is that um, although Twitter is very timely and you need to like, keep posting to kind of stay on top of things, although they are experimenting with algorithm timelines, so uh, that's not going to be as important as it used to be, uh, Facebook, you may notice, you'll see, you'll see um, posts from Facebook from a couple of days ago. So uh, if something's doing really well, you may see it for a couple of days, or it may show up in the news feed, so it's not as timely. So I, uh, as far as Facebook goes, I would say uh, for us, we post once or twice a day. Tumblr, we post like two to three times a day just based on uh, our, you know, our, our rate of content, what we can turn out, what other people on the platform are, what our peers on the platform are doing, um, so, uh, and the content that we can share. So uh, the number the number of pieces of content we put out. So uh, once you've kind of figured out how many pieces of content you have, and you don't want to necessarily share them all at once, uh, you can figure out what the uh, what that spread. And I believe uh, bu uh, there I believe Buffer will allow you to. Um, we use TweetDeck. We don't use Buffer, but I believe Buffer will allow you to. Uh, once you set those posts, and then automatically tweet them out to. Um, uh, automatically tweet them out at different intervals depending on how many pieces of content you have. So, uh, and I'll look, I'll, I'll double check that and look it up at, on Twitter after the presentation. Okay, we are running short on time, so we're going to do one more question and then we're going to need to wrap it up. And of course, Brandon is, you can find him on Twitter, so you can always ask your question there and you can also ask questions using the ComNet Live hashtag. Uh, so, Brandon, you mentioned BuzzFeed various verticals and the question that Robin here is asking is, should there be a different persona for each vertical? And if not, how can a single persona per, uh, accommodate disparate verticals? Wow, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, um, absolutely. I think that uh, BuzzFeed actually does have different personas for each vertical. And uh, we didn't get really to allude to it, but uh, for example, like uh, Geeky BuzzFeed is like your friend who's like super into uh, the person who runs that, the, the persona for that uh, vertical is like, yeah, um, the per, your like super geeky friend who loves like Doctor Who and comic books and stuff like that, uh, and then there's a uh, weird Buzzfeed, which is actually one of my favorite verticals of Buzzfeed, which is uh, essentially just uh, you know uh, if there's there's something called weird Twitter out there that you guys may or may not know, but it's just like uh, very surreal jokes and very funny, a lot of internet humor and stuff like that, and that the person the the persona for that vertical is completely different from the persona who uh, of Buzzfeed Geeky, which is completely different from the persona of Buzzfeed in general. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I would not say, like, you want to, you, I would create a different, if you have different verticals or different accounts on your social media networks, I mean, treat them as different people. Come up with more than one persona. Come up with a persona that would match each, uh, each uh, person. All right. And hey, Brian, uh, Brandon, excuse me. Oof. Uh, can you repeat the persona link that you guys have created at SciFry? Of course. Uh, so, oh, you know, I think I, uh, let me, uh, so it's scifry.me, let's go, let's actually go back to it. It's scifry.me slash uh, persona worksheet. And you guys, I apologize, I thought I put that at the end of the uh, presentation, but I guess not. Um, so let me just get that up there so you guys can uh, see it. Here it is. Will you tweet yeah. it out afterwards? There we go. Absolutely. Yep, I'll, uh, I'll tweet it out afterwards as well. So I'm at Ector. I'll tweet it out there. Um, I also put this presentation on a uh, slide share, which I think you guys are going to be sending out as well, but I'll also tweet it out there as well. So, um, yeah, if you guys, uh, or if there's any materials that I talked about here that you guys, uh, or any articles that you reference, just let me know. I'll be happy to uh, get them out to you. Uh, in general, right. to everybody, not just ComNet. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, so uh, Brandon, thank you so much, and to everyone who joined us, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I can tell just by following this on social media, people loved the GIFs. So this is going to have to be maybe a new thing for us because uh, it certainly kept us uh, entertaining and engaging. 
So listen, uh, if you didn't already know this, you can follow Science Friday on Twitter at SciFry, that's S-C-I, Fry, F-R-I. And Brandon, of course, is at B. Ector. Uh, and of course, thank you to everyone again for joining us. I hope you learned as much as I did, and I learned a lot. Uh, if you would, just before you jump off, take a quick second. There'll be a survey that's going to pop up on your uh, webinar there. It takes you no more than a minute, maybe even less than that. Just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you're digging it so we can try to improve what we're doing here. And of course, uh, as you recall, as I said at the outset, we will be posting this webinar up online in its entirety in a week or two's time. Kind of bold, final notes before we let you go. So if you haven't already heard, we are accepting breakout proposals for ComNet 16, which will be in Detroit at the end of September. Uh, you need to submit those ideas by the end of April, April 22nd to be exact, and you can find everything you need, uh, how to put a breakout proposal in, FAQs, where the conference is, all that good stuff is at comnet16.org, that's C-O-M-N-E-T 16.org. And then last little bit, some news today. So for many of you who have been part of the network for a while, you know we did a big series last year with the Stanford Social Innovation Review, and it got such an amazing response, we decided that we would do it again. Uh, so this year, we just beginning today, we've launched a series called The Case for Communications. And over the next five or six months uh, in this series, you're going to get uh, case studies that will lay out what an organization used, uh, an organization using social, uh, boy, Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm tripping over my words here. That use strategic communications to advance a big goal or objective. So really, case studies of impact, where communications worked and why. You can catch that all at ssirreview.org. The first one's up there today. Thanks again, everybody. Look forward to seeing you soon. For those folks who are aware, we are also doing a live stream that just got underway up at Philanthropy New York. That's a CEO session being led by Dr. Riza Levizo More. She's the CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and CEOs from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Commonwealth Fund are joining her. Talk a little bit more about how foundations who are funding research try to get that out into the world and make a difference with it. We hope you'll check that out. We'll be following it along on Twitter as well. Talk to you all soon. Thanks.